Hey, my name is Joel. Welcome to part two of my discussion of drum physics and why drums sound the way they sound. This particular video is going to deal with bearing edges. There's a lot of information on the internet about bearing edges, lots of articles, lots of videos. Most of it's really pretty good stuff, but it can be pretty heady and it can be seemingly conflicting and, um, and it just seems overly complicated. There's so many different edges. There's you got, you know, single cuts of 15, 30, 45, 60 degrees, and you got counter cuts of various types. You've got roundovers, you've got a full vintage roundover, and then you have like a 30 degree with a vintage roundover on the outside. And you've got all these variations. Um, you know, you might have a dozen different types of cuts that different companies use. <clears throat> and there's good reason for all of them. But communicating those and then pairing the appropriate cut or bearing edge with a shell in order to achieve the sound that you're wanting to achieve sometimes can seem a little mystifying. And so I want to simplify that if I can. So if you have not seen my previous video, I will be re referring to a few realities of that discussion. Uh, and I'll link to it below. It, it spoke uh, specifically about the effect of mass on the sound of a drum, the, the, the mass of the drum shell. So I'll link to that below. Uh, and if you find this kind of stuff interesting, I think you'll find that interesting. So in that last video, I actually did a lot of reading from an old sonar catalog from 1982 that had a lot of their research and their thinking about why they designed the product line the way they did at that point in time. Uh, and that was really useful for the discussion because they made really massive drums, drum shells that had a lot of mass in them. And the reasoning behind that, it wasn't by accident, it was by design. That was really useful for that discussion. I don't have the same type of thing here. I wrote my own copy, basically, so I could kind of stay on topic and not waste too much time bloviating and chasing rabbit trails and things. So this is just something that I have written here. And uh, I will just begin my discussion this way. Bearing edges. The definition of a bearing edge. A drum's bearing edge is the portion of the drum shell that makes direct contact with the drum head. Ideally, the apex of the edge should constitute a flat plane, and the machined contour of the edge should be consistent around the entire circumference of the drum. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, if you take a drum and take the uh, bearing edge of the drum, a flat plane, it doesn't mean that the edges are flat, they have a contour, whatever shape they have, but the apex, the highest point of the edge, if you turn that over and set it down on a completely flat surface and shine a light on the inside of it, you shouldn't see any light around the edge. The plane of that surface of that drum, of that bearing edge, should be entirely flat. And then whatever shape you have, if it's a 45 degree single cut or a dual 45 or a vintage roundover or whatever it is, that needs to be a consistent shape all the way around the drum. So that a quality edge will have those two characteristics. Um, and a drum's bearing edge serves two main purposes. One, it determines the boundary or the diameter of the active portion of the drum head. What do I mean by active portion of the drum head? If you think of a guitar and you uh, put your finger on the fretboard, it basically <clears throat> effectively shortens the length of the string uh, from that fret down to the bridge is now shorter because you've put your finger on the fretboard and so you've raised the pitch of the string. So that's the active portion of the string. There's still more of the string on the other side. It's just not active. One could argue, yes, you can hear it audibly, but there's no pickups, there's no sound hole, there's nothing on that side of the string. So the active portion is the portion that's over the body of the guitar, basically. So the same is true with a drum head. Uh, where that edge is, it's sort of like a fret, but instead of it just being a linear fret, it's sort of like a fret that goes 360 degrees around the whole circumference of a cylinder. When the drum head touches that, everything inside of that is the active portion of the head. And it seems like it's kind of silly to define that, to point that out, but that, that's kind of important. Um, and that will be kind of important later on when I talk about the collar of the drum head. So I will get to that. Um, but <clears throat> you could theoretically have a 12 inch drum and you put a 12 inch head on it, but really most modern drums anyway, aren't quite the full diameter. You might have a 12 inch head, but the shell itself is probably more like 11 and seven eighths inch diameter. And that's so the head can drop on it and you can basically take a finger and kind of turn the head around on the top of the drum. It's, it's, it's loose enough that, um, it's, you know, it's not a snug tight fit. Let's say that shell is like half an inch thick which is pretty thick, but still 
for the sake of discussion, let's say it's half an inch thick and you've got a dual 45 um, edge, which I haven't gotten into the different types of edges yet, but most people I think know what that is. It basically means a 45 degree cut from one side and then a 45 degree cut on the other side. And that point or that apex, let's say is centered between the plies of the, the veneer that make up the shell. So it's half an inch thick. The, the apex is halfway in the middle of that. So that means it's a quarter of an inch in from the edge of the diameter of the drum, right? So you've got that on both sides. So that's half an inch basically coming off of a drum shell that say 11 and seven eighths inch. So now you're talking an active diameter of a 12 inch Tom that is 11 and three eighths of an inch in diameter. Now, does that matter? Not really. Not going to lose sleep over that. Not a big deal. Um, but for the sake of explanation, the edge does define the outer boundary of the active portion of the drum head determines the diameter, the actual active diameter of any given drum. Secondly, it determines the amount of surface area contact between the shell and the drum head, which directly affects the amount of energy transferred from a vibrating drum head to the shell. What do I mean by that? Well, a round edge is going to have more surface contact between the edge and the drum head. And the more contact that there is between surfaces, the more energy can be transferred from a vibrating head into the shell, which will affect the drum's performance. So um, if it's a really, really thin, narrow, sharp edge, it's not going to have a lot of surface contact. Not as much energy is going to be able to be transferred from the head into the shell when the head is vibrating. So you'll have a little more isolation on the drum head and that will result in some fairly different things, which I'll get to here in just a moment. So continuing, I do like to keep things simple and practical. There are so many different types of bearing edges. And if you've ever looked at articles on them, you'll see all sorts of graphics and you'll, again, you'll hear about 15, 30 degree, 45 degree, 60 degree, a double 45, all the various vintage roundovers, a full vintage roundover, which is like a semicircle. It's not even an angle. It's just rounded. Um, so many different types of edges. And I like to keep things very simple because really, as such, every type of bearing edge that I'm aware of can really be classified into one of two categories. And that is sharp or rounded edges. And so one note to go with that here, the sharpness or the roundness of a bearing edge is independent of the amount of angle that is used for the edge's primary cut. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a 15 degree cut, a 30 degree cut, a 45 degree cut. People generally, you will read often that a 30 de degree cut has a mellower sound than a 45 degree cut. The truth is, as I have noticed anyway, the sharpness or roundness of the bearing edge is independent of the amount of angle. In other words, I'm dividing everything into two categories, sharp edges and round edges. And it could be that these are single cut, 15 degree cut with a round edge or a 15 degree cut with a sharp edge, 45 degree cut or a 30 degree cut with a round edge or a 45 or a 30 degree cut with a sharp edge. I hope I said that right, but you can have sharp or round on any of those cuts. It really just depends on how you sand it and how you, you know, what kind of a radius you give that apex. So <clears throat> I'm just pointing that out because people really seem to get wound up about, well, I really want a 30 degree um, because that's what this vintage drum company used back in the day. And I want a vintage tone or whatever. And it's like, okay, 30 degree, that's fine. But what kind of treatment was done to the apex of the edge? Was it a sharp edge? Or if it was vintage, it was probably fairly mellow. So it was sanded down, it was rounded off or whatever. So I just wanted to point out that the angle and the roundness or sharpness are not necessarily the same thing. I find that any angle of cut, if brought to a sharp apex, yields very similar performance. There is, as I will touch on later, some science that sort of shows that there are, in fact, differences. But I stick to this that it's very similar performance. You're talking super minute things here. Not enough to get bent out of shape about. Really, sharp and rounded are really the two concepts that all of the edges that you're going to ever see can be fairly directly filed into. And yes, there's definitely that middle point, somewhere between super sharp and super round, and you, know, you can kind of find that middle ground. But again, the idea is that there's really two approaches, and everything sort of fits into that. Okay, so let's talk about sharp edges. Sharp edges provide minimal surface area contact between the shell and the drum head. 
As such, sharp edges preserve most of the energy of a drum strike in the drum head, which, number one, preserves the high frequency or harmonic content of the drum head. So let me stop here real quick. So a sharp edge has very, very little surface contact between the edge of the shell and the drum head itself. As such, there's going to be very little transfer of energy, relatively all things being similar, from that drum head into the shell. So as a result, it's going to preserve the high frequency or the harmonic content of the drum head. The drum head's gonna be able to do its full thing as much as possible because it's really left to its own with all the energy. So it's gonna have a higher harmonic content. And number two, it provides longer sustain from the head because again, that energy is not being bled off into the shell. This overlaps a little bit into my previous discussion on the previous video. So again, you might wanna go check that out if you haven't yet. Uh, and then number three, it preserves a fuller fundamental tone. This definitely goes along with the previous video because uh, the, the greater the mass of the shell, as I discussed in that video, um, the harder it is to excite that shell into vibration. And therefore the shell takes on a more passive role, leaving the energy in the heads, providing greater sustain and a stronger fundamental note. So the lower pitch, the actual pitch of the drum, the fundamental tone of the drum is going to be stronger in a thicker shell. If the shell is thinner and it can accept energy from the head a lot easier and it's easier to excite into vibration, then it's gonna rob some of that energy from the head as the shell starts to vibrate. And so you're gonna have less sustain and that sort of 360 degree kind of thing going on with the vibrating shell actually serves to dampen the fundamental pitch or tone of the drum. So it winds up being a brighter sounding drum. It doesn't have more harmonic content as I spell out in that video. It just has less of the lower frequency fundamental content. So it feels brighter and it feels a little louder because our ears are more sensitive to higher frequencies than it is lower frequencies. So we sometimes make the mistake of thinking it's louder. It's really not louder. There's actually less amplitude there because the harmonic content hasn't been boosted, but the lower frequency content has just been attenuated. So when you remove frequency content from a sound, you're removing amplitude as well. It's actually a softer sound. Um, so <clears throat> that's sharp edges. Let's move on to round edges. Round edges provide greater surface area contact between the shell and the drum head. It's the opposite of sharp. Round, more surface contact versus the sharp, which has less contact. As such, the round edges transfer more energy from the vibrating drum head into the shell, which, number one, attenuates the high frequency or the harmonic content of the sound. So unlike the sharp edge, which uh, allows the head to have its full high frequency and harmonic content, the greater contact with the bearing edge transferring energy from the head is actually going to attenuate the high frequencies. Whenever you muffle a drum, whether you're muffling it with uh, moon gel or tape or whether you're sticking a wallet on it, if you're just trying to shorten the sound of the drum, once you muffle it to accomplish that, what's the first thing to go? The high frequency. Anytime you inhibit the drum head's ability to vibrate, the high frequency is the first thing to go. So if the bearing edge is actually attenuating the, the head's ability to, to vibrate, then the high frequency is going to be affected similarly. So it's gonna attenuate the high frequency harmonic content. Number two, it's gonna shorten the sustain of the head because again, that energy is bleeding off away from the head so the energy doesn't stay in the heads. So the heads sustain for a less, for a shorter length of time. And then number three, it mutes the fundamental tone. This is again, reference to the previous video, which not only affects the frequency response, but actually lowers the overall sound pressure level of the drum. That's what I was just talking about. The drum sounds brighter and so it might feel louder because it's a more frequency content that we are sensitive to, um, but it's actually a lower, quieter sound. And I did put one note here, which I think is pretty important. The extent to which a given drum will experience a muted fundamental is largely re reliant upon the overall mass and stiffness of the drum shell as well. So if you have a really massive, meaning a drum shell with a lot of mass, a very dense, heavy drum shell, and you have rounded edges on it, so it's bleeding a lot of energy from the head into the shell, the shell may be so massive still that it really doesn't start resonating. And so you're not really going to lose much of that fundamental lower pitch 
it's just going to attenuate the high end a little bit and shorten the decay a little bit, although not as much as if the shell actually really did start vibrating. But just the additional friction of the rounded edge and that greater contact is going to limit the decay somewhat as well, the, the sustain. So what you wind up with in that situation, a heavy shell with round edges, is a very dull sounding drum. A drum that's very tubby sounding and certainly from any distance once you get away from the drum if you're using multiple like a excuse me a minimal miking technique or something and uh, so nothing's close to the drum you know get a few feet from the drum and a lot of the attack that you get or a lot of the harmonic content of the head um, sort of just dissipates with the viscosity of air and so when you have a heavy drum that's got dull edges, you don't have a lot of highs to begin with, you're gonna lose even more of those over any kind of distance, and the only thing that you're really gonna hear is the strength of the low frequency. So you're gonna have these really tubby sounding drums. It might be a sound that you dig. I like to have all the high frequency content as well, so I like single ply heads and fairly sharp edges with my heavy drums. And if you watched the last video, you know that I do love heavy drums. Although I will say this, in my defense, I don't know that I need to say defense. I'm not really defending myself. But I did get a lot of comments from people, which, by the way, I really appreciate the comments. Please, please keep those coming. I love the discussion. It, 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 it makes me have to think about what I'm saying and, and, uh, and really you know, dive to understand things a little bit more and explain things, maybe figure out new ways to explain things, too. So I love that. Please keep that coming. But I did get comments from people defending thin shell drums, you know, as if I didn't like them. And... I have thin shell drums. I've got very resonant drums that are thin shells. They're punchy, shorter decay, brighter tone. And I love that. The truth is I love drums. I love all drums. I do have a preference toward the heavier drums. There's just something about playing them that just seems to fit with me in a visceral sense. And I really, really enjoy it. But I love drums, and I'll get bored with anything after a while. I just want to switch to a different kit and have a different sound. So engineers love me because I'm always changing my drums around. So um, I usually ask, what kind of sound do you want? And I'll bring whatever I think is going to work for what they want. But, uh, but I have all kinds of different drums, and I love them all. So for what that's worth. Okay, moving back to this. So let's discuss just a few realities about certain types of edges. Okay, roundover edges. Here's a roundover. And you can see you've got the 45 degree cut, and then this is actually a little bit rounded. It's just kind of curved a little bit versus this, which is a double 45. It's got a 45 on each side. Here's a vintage roundover. It's rounded at the top and it's rounded around the edge. It's obviously, it's got a reinforcing ring. Um, here is a 45 with a 45 counter cut. That's a little further out toward the edge, whereas the double 45 is centered. These are just terms that people uh, some of these terms are interchangeable. They don't always mean the exact same thing. So it's good when people are throwing out terms to kind of ask them for clarification's sake exactly what they mean. But this roundover edge is really designed. Let me go back to my little document that I made here. Roundover edges are often designed to fit the contour of a drum head's rounded collar. Now, drum heads. Here's a drum head. If you look at it, you've got the, the hoop here. And then you've got the playing surface up here, which is higher than the hoop because there's this little rounded collar. So it just kind of goes up and then it's kind of rounded. So a roundover edge is often meant to kind of fit up inside that rounded head. That does two things. One, it conforms to the shape of the head because the heads, mylar heads, plastic heads are formed like that at the factory. And so it conforms to that shape so it doesn't put any additional stress on the head, trying to force it into some sort of other shape than what it was made to have. Uh, and it increases the surface area of contact between the edge and the head because a rounded edge tucked into this collar here is making a lot of surface contact. So you get a lot of transfer of energy when you do that. This makes greater surface contact between the drum head film and the drum shell without forcing a different shape to the drum head. Now, what do I mean by a different shape to the drum head? This here, it's kind of hard to see my pointer. But if you have a standard single 45 cut, this is the outside of the drum head here. Here's the hoop of the drum head. Here's the collar, the rounded portion. And if you just have a single cut, basically, or just a barely counter cut, you know, single cut design, and it could be a 45 or 30, it could be anything, that will make contact with the collar 
And if you were to draw a straight line horizontally from that apex, it's below the actual top of the head because it's stuck in the collar. It's not actually in the horizontal or the flat portion of the drum head. So can you tune this? Yes, you certainly can. Um, but you would have to force down, you know, tighten the, the, the head up to get this to stretch and become flatter and be able to be more tunable. So you're not gonna have as much range by the time you've already applied enough pressure to force it flat from its natural curved state, you've already raised the pitch. Um, it's, you know, you're not gonna have the tuning range. It's gonna be trickier to tune evenly. You're just gonna have problems. Whereas having a double 45 cut like they have here, or just a counter cut that comes in a few uh, applies from the edge, allows you to put the apex of the edge right up to the horizontal flush portion of the head. That allows for a broader tuning range and greater ease of tuning. So that's something to consider with your edges. So single cut edges, regardless of the angle used, if not rounded over, can make contact with the collar of the drum head, causing tuning challenges, which is what I was just saying. As such, modern drums using single cuts will often be of slightly reduced outer diameter, so the apex of the bearing edge will meet the horizontal plane of the drum head, allowing for greater ease of tuning and wider tuning range. So some manufacturers, like Sonar is one of them, they tend to make their shells a little bit smaller diameter than perhaps other companies, so that edges will be tucked inside the collar, making more appropriate connection with the head. Now that does make putting a head on a little trickier because you have to make sure that you have the the head centered over the drum shell because it can actually slide around a little bit, you know, kind of back and forth uh, on a on a smaller shell. But that's kind of their way of getting around uh, the hitting it in the collar and causing tuning problems. Dual cuts or counter cuts place the apex of the edge further toward the center plies of the shell, making better contact with the horizontal plane of the drum head, also allowing for greater ease and range of tuning. So whether it's a smaller diameter in a single cut or whether you're using counter cuts to bring the apex closer to the middle and get it away from the collar, then you'll actually have greater ease of tuning. So that's something on a practical, whether it's a, a round edge, a mellow edge, you know, or a sharp edge, just knowing where it contacts the drum head is gonna help you get better tuning. That's basically the majority of all I have to say. I hope that sort of simplifies it for you. I am gonna add one more thing here, and that is basically to discuss the differences that do exist between the various angles that are typically used for bearing edges, because there are measurable differences, even though I don't consider them to be particularly substantive and something that you need to really be worried about or losing sleep over. But the practical effects of differing angles used for a bearing edge's primary cut, and by that I mean like you're talking either it's a single cut, you know, a 30 degree cut, or a 30 degree with a vintage round over or whatever, but there's, there's that primary cut. So whether it's 15, 30, 45, 60, whatever it is. But the practical effects of those differing angles are these. Number one, the event horizon or the boundary layer which is the small amount of edge material that is immediately adjacent to the apex of the bearing edge, will differ among various primary angles used for the bearing edges. Now, what is that? Let's go look over here. So here's a graphic that shows four different angles. And basically this line across the top is the drum head. So basically with a 15 degree cut, it makes contact right there at that little point, 30 degree right there at that little point, 45 degree right there at that little point, 60 degree right there at that little point. So basically with a fairly sharp edge, this is if you look at it, it's actually slightly rounded, but it's still a nice sharp edge. With a sharp edge, that's why I was saying a 15, 30, 45 or 60 degree angle doesn't really make a huge difference. Where there is a difference is in this little spot right here, right next to the apex. There's a video that I will link to below that was done by, I think, the Discovery Channel. It was done with Mike Mangini from Dream Theater, and it was super slow motion of him playing snare drum and cymbals and things like that. So you can see how much the drum heads move. You can see how the cymbals warp when they get hit and all this stuff that we never really see with the naked eye because our eyes just don't respond that quickly or our brain doesn't. I'm not sure which. But super slow motion, when he hits a very tightly tuned snare, I mean, the, the, the movement, you should go check that out if you haven't seen it. It's pretty cool to watch. But the movement, it's like a trampoline just bouncing back and forth, this really tightly tuned drum head. And so basically, 
with a shallow edge, you know, if you've got a 15 degree angle and the drum head's doing this and then the drum head's vibrating, right? Like it shows in that video when you watch in slow motion, it's going to make contact elsewhere besides just the apex as it's vibrating, right? And with that contact is going to be some level of attenuation of the high frequencies of the sustain. There's going to be some additional bleed off of the energy from the drum head with that. So a shallower angle is going to experience more of that. So you will have more loss or greater transfer of energy from the head when you are laying into it with a shallower angle than with a steeper angle, which you would have to hit harder to get the same amount of contact to the adjacent, you know, uh, contour of the, of the bearing edge. So I hope that that makes sense. It is a measurable difference, but again, in practice, not so much. Um, what I've said here, as a drum head vibrates, shallower angles will produce greater contact between the head and the event horizon, providing greater attenuation of the head's vibration. In my experience, this effect, if minimal, if minimal, how do you like that? I spelled that wrong. It is minimal, as what I meant to write, and can be greatly reduced given other factors of the drum's design and construction. By that, I mean you're going to have a bigger difference in the performance of your drum, whether it's a thin lightweight drum or whether it's a heavy drum, whether it's a heavy, dense drum shell that's a fairly soft material or whether it's a thin material that's very rigid, you know, you're going to have more of an impact on the sound pairing any edge to those types of shells than you will by having a 15 degree or a 30 degree or a 45 degree. So I typically, I'm kind of just go with the 45. Uh, I don't really want the edge muffling the sound. If I did, I kind of go with a vintage, you know, kind of a, a round over, I guess, on the outside uh, to create a little bit more of that. But I'm kind of a 45 degree guy. It is fairly generic, um, but but not entirely. I mean, edges really should be paired, I think, for optimum performance uh, to meet your design objective should be paired with the appropriate type of shell. So the other factor of differing angles is this. Number two, the steeper the angle of the edge, the more material is removed from the drum shell, reducing its mass. So if you go back over to this picture here, you've got a 15 degree edge here. And so there's this material has been removed. When it was cut to the depth of the shell, that was originally flat. And they cut this angle here for the edge. 30 degree, they cut a lot more out in 45 and 60. So you can see at 60 for sure, there's a lot more material that's being cut out. And not just in a linear, you know, fashion, as you can kind of see in this cutaway drawing here, but 360 degrees all the way around the drum, top and bottom, if it's a double headed drum. So there's more mass being reduced. And when you go back to the first video of the discussion of mass, as you remove mass, you're lightening the low end a little bit, you're reducing somewhat the, the um, sustain and things like that. Is this important? The impact of this loss of mass will likely be greater for smaller drums than larger, though again, it's probably not something to lose sleep over. It's, it's you know, whether you have a steep angle or not a steep angle, you're talking about the bearing edge of like a big drum, you know, and it's not a ton of material. So yes, you're removing mass with a steeper cut. It doesn't matter. You know, again, might be measurable under some very strict scientific uh, circumstances for measuring um, in the real world. Does it matter? Not so much. So I want to talk about this because these are things that people might come back and say that, oh, you know, this is, what about this? What about this? And I kind of want to cover the basis. But again, I just want to simplify. Really, we're talking sharp edges, round edges. So the conclusion, bearing edges do not exist on an island, so to speak. I know that's kind of a weird way to say that, but unaffected by other variables within a drum's design. There is no best bearing edge design that is ideal for all types of drums. Rather, a good bearing edge design will work in concert with other factors of the shell construction to achieve a desired performance. So let's say you wanted a drum that was really great for smaller, um, lower volume environments. Maybe you are or not using, you know, uh, sound reinforcement. Maybe you've got like a little combo jazz thing going or something. A very lightweight shell 
with a roundover would be a good choice for that because the roundover would attenuate the high end, the lightweight shell would vibrate rather easily, particularly with the roundover that provides a lot of contact between the head and the shell. So there's a lot of transfer of energy from the head into the shell. So you drop the sustain, um, you drop the low frequency a little bit, the round edge actually drops the high frequency a little bit. So you still have a fairly balanced drum sound, but it's quieter overall, better for low volume environments. Also great for recording. It's, you know, it's, so you have a lot of control over those types of drums, big, heavy drums with very narrow edges. So lots of high end, lots of sustain and lots of volume and lots of low end and everything. Probably is a little overwhelming for that type of an environment. You know, in the studio, you still have some control and you can do things with it, but pairing the edge to the type of shell that you have for the purpose of that drum. Not all drums are suited ideally to every type of circumstance. And so some drums really are great for certain types of tunings and certain types of music and certain types of venues and whatever, while other drums are better for other things. So it's it's the beauty of of the art of making drums. But this is a little bit of the science, kind of street science, I guess, practical uh, to kind of help you understand, hopefully, the effect that the bearing edge has on the overall drum sound. And in case you didn't notice, this is now the only the second video. And I'm going to do several more because there are several other factors. And you will see that sort of the intersection of these various factors will sort of offset and counter each other. And um, none of these characteristics really exist on a desert island, so to speak. They really do interact with one another. And so it's good to understand the contribution that each makes so that you can decide what kinds of drums you want to buy, whether they're pre-manufactured or whether you want to have some made or whether you want to have new edges cut on some drums that you already have or whatever the case may be. So it's good to understand these things so that you can get the tones that you're wanting to capture. I hope this is helpful in letting you do that. I will continue this series with more videos. Again, if you'd like to geek out on this stuff, please subscribe, hit the bell button so that you are notified when I do new uploads. And please share it with like-minded geeks, <laughs> drum geeks and, and producers and people who record drums and, and just want to understand why drums sound the way they sound. I think it's useful for a lot of people, not just drummers. And of course, I think it's very, very fun. So thank you for being here. Thank you for checking this out. And I will see you next time.